Welcome to Martial Arts World Radio. I'm your host, Joseph Clark. How do you make a reality of your goals? How do we overcome loss and turn misfortune into opportunity? We ask these and other relevant questions of today's martial arts stars. Each week in every show, we speak to different fighters from the UFC, Olympic martial arts medalists, and world champion martial artists, or kickboxing icons, many of whom have gone on to become stars of martial arts cinema. Thanks for tuning in. We have a great show for you today. Now, I have a book to bring to your attention. Check out an old classic, The Tao of Jeet Kune Do by Bruce Lee. Very applicable both to the classical traditional martial artist and today's MMA fighter. Also check out 21st Century Perspectives on Martial Arts, a book with experience and wisdom for the classical traditionalist martial artist and the MMA fighter. You can Google both books or find them at Amazon. I was checking various websites this past week to see what they suggested were the number one martial arts films of all time. Now, I didn't source out MMA films. I specifically looked for the number one martial arts film of all time. Curiously, Black Belt Magazine suggests the number one film was Jackie Chan's Drunken Master 2. Internet Movie Database suggested that Bruce Lee's Fist of Fury is the number one martial arts film of all time. And Ranker.com, which has a survey in which 17,000 members of the public voted, has Bruce Lee's Enter the Dragon as the number one martial arts film of all time. What do you think was the best martial arts film of all time? This week's inspirational quote is from Gandhi and goes as follows, quote, Strength does not come from physical capacity. It comes from an indomitable will. Mahatma Gandhi, 1869 until his assassination in 1948. Hi, I'm Don the Dragon Wilson, and you're listening to Joseph Clark at Martial Arts World Radio. UFC lightweight fighter Alex Ricci is a talented mixed martial artist with an impressive professional record. Hailing from Woodbridge, Ontario, Canada, he has also fought with Bellator and has experience fighting UFC veterans. He's also a former Muay Thai kickboxing champion with 17 years of experience. Alex is also a coach and trainer who brings passion and tremendous energy to his training. He is committed to training hard and smart while maintaining a healthy and balanced lifestyle. Alex, welcome to Martial Arts World Radio. Hey, Joseph. Thank you for having me. I love your show, by the way. A lot of positive stuff about the martial arts community, which I love, and uh, I'm glad to be a part of it. Oh, thanks very much, Alex. We're glad to have you be part of it. What does your training regimen look like these days? Well, right now, I'm actually in Las Vegas, uh, the fight capital of the world, training with one of the best striking coaches in boxing and mixed martial arts. I'm training with Angelo Reyes. and uh, Angelo Reyes, very good. We are basically training two a days and i'm just surrounded by martial art geniuses uh two-time world champion boxing world champion anna gulipin is one of my teammates and i'm also training with uh former two-time world champion frank mir who is also mentoring me and training with me as well so uh, we got a very very tight team down here in vegas and like i said angelo like he is uh, like he's an amazing super coach, and uh, like I'm, I'm learning his system right now. I'm, an ex- I'm, I'm very excited to be showcasing it in my next uh, next fight, hopefully soon. Ah, good stuff. Now, Alex, you know the first martial art I was introduced to was Krav Maga in the Canadian Forces, but my foundation martial art was called Shirinji Kempo. Do you have a particular style which stands that stands out that you consider your foundation style? Yes, my, my foundation is Muay Thai based. That's what I originally started with. I fell in love with the art when I was 14 years old, and I dedicated my whole life to learning, uh, learning the craft and uh, competing at the highest level. And, you know, one of the questions that I ask of guests quite frequently on this show is, is there an advantage to somebody who has a grappling background who then learns striking, or is there an advantage to a striker or a Muay Thai fighter who then learns grappling. What do you think? I think for MMA, it's, uh, I think the striker has an advantage because at the end of the day, we start up on our feet. And uh, so that's where we get the advantage. So uh, I think it would be a, a better situation where, you know, like you'd first learn how to strike and then, and then go to the ground. But uh, 
like everybody has their passions and for me I've I'm a I'm a striker I love to uh, entertain with fashionable knockouts and uh, you know that's what I gravitated towards more but hey not that there's also a lot of dangerous grapplers out there that know how to strike as well. And in mixed martial arts at the highest level, you got to be able to do everything. You got to be able to strike, wrestle, and grapple. And on top of that, you got to be able to sing, dance, and act because this is an entertainment business and the UFC loves entertainment. So, Alex, powerlifting, bodybuilding, weight training, strength training, how much of that do you have to incorporate to your regimen? I've, I've done a lot of Olympic lifting, so um, in the past, I've really gained a lot through doing uh, weight training twice a week. Now, every fighter is different, uh, depending on what you need, what, what type of regimen you're on. Um, so typically, I would be in the weight room twice a week, and uh, I would be doing a lot of uh, functional strength training, um, more more for strengthening my core and keeping my foundation very strong. We would do a lot of uh, speed training, agility training, explosiveness, power, and conditioning. But at the same time, you don't want to overdo it too in the weight room because you got to save your energy for the more important days like sparring and pads and all that stuff because at the end of the day, you know, we're not lifting weights when we step in the octagon. we gotta, we got to punch and kick and defend the takedowns and all that fun stuff. And sometimes I think uh, fighters get too caught up in the weight room, which uh, you know can uh, hinder you a little bit if if you're not if you're not careful because it is very taxing on the body. So you got to train smart. You got to be in tune with your body, your mind, and uh, you got to kind of go with how you feel. You know. So, but I've done a lot of weight training, definitely a lot of strength and conditioning. Sounds like good advice for our future champions who are listening tonight, Alex. I'm going to put you on the spot here with some deeper questions. What has been your most memorable victory to date? My memorable victory. I've had many, but my most memorable was probably back in 2006 when I competed in the Contender Asia, and it was an eight-man tournament with eight of the best Muay Thai fighters in Canada, and we were competing to go on to the, the Contender Asia show, which was being hosted in Malaysia. So I competed, uh, I had to fight three times, so a single elimination. If you get, if you lose, you're out. So my first fight, knocked out my first opponent, knocked out my first opponent. Second fight of the night, um, I won by decision. And then the third fight of the night, I, I won by knockout. But there was a very big controversy that night, or the next day actually, because uh, I got dropped in the second round, and I came back and I dropped I dropped my opponent. His name was Jesse Miles, Mike Miles' his stepson. And I dropped him about seven seconds left of the final round, and the crowd was going crazy. And uh, they announced that he was out cold, okay? And they announced me the winner. They presented me the trophy that night. But the next day I got a phone call from the promoter saying that, well, because of uh, technicality, the ref waved out the fight two seconds after the final bell rang, but we, nobody heard it because the crowd was going crazy. So they went back to the scorecards, and because I personally think I still won the fight because I won the first round, he dropped me twice in the second round, and I, and I finished them in the third round. But uh, they gave him the decision due to technicality. So... He was knocked out cold, but still won the fight, so I give it to him. But overall, it's not about, for me, it's not about winning or losing. It's about learning and growing as a martial artist, and that was one of the greatest experiences of my life, being able to compete like against three of the best strikers in Canada. It was a great time for me, and it was very memorable, and uh, I'll never forget that. So, Alex, when you look back over your fight career and training to date, is there a particular lesson or moral that stands out? You got to keep going because in this in this journey as a martial artist, there's going to be a lot of crossroads, and you can't get discouraged. You can't get frustrated. You got to persevere and overcome all of these obstacles. Failing is part of the process, so you got to learn how to roll with the punches, take the punches because that's what's part of being a fighter is all about. You got to be able to get t- get hit and and hit right back. You know, there's a lot of lot of ups and downs in this game, so you just got to be ready. You got to be focused, and you got to really truly believe in yourself, in your skill, and surround yourself 
with with the right people that are going to help pave that way for you to get to your goal. And that's very important for me, my journey. Like, I'm so very fortunate that I had that, that great support. And, you know, I never gave up. And trust me, there was many times where I just said, you know what, I'm I'm done. I can't do this no more. But and you know, there's that little little thing inside me that just said, you know what, just keep going, keep going. One more day, one more day. And uh, and you know, it's like it paid off in the long run. I just kept on going, kept on training, kept on learning throughout all of the mistakes that I made. And uh, I'm here right now where I am. Now, Alex, before we go on, is there a place on the web or social networking that you would like to direct our listeners tonight if they're curious about you? Yes, you could check me out at Alex Ricci MMA. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Also, you could uh, check me out on my uh, website at m1thaiboxing.com. I own a gym in Woodbridge, Ontario, just north of Toronto, where I teach and train Thai boxing and mixed martial arts to all levels and uh, all, all walks of life for everybody. So, you know, we have a great program there where I teach a lot of kids and, and adults of all levels and ages. And uh, that's my that's my uh, that's kind of my thing that I do on the side. That's the beauty about being a martial artist. We're able to do many things, right? We're not we're not we're not only just fighters, right? We're we're businessmen. We're entrepreneurs, and uh, you know, it, it, being a martial artist allows somebody to branch off into many different different areas. Really cool thing. Now, Alex, I, we're coming up to the uh, to the close of this interview. It goes by so quickly, so we hope you'll join us again. But I have a question here that I'd like to ask you, and I think you'd be the ideal guest to answer this. In all of my roles in life, in my corporate career as a father, in this radio show, there are times where I have to deal with insecurities, fears, and doubts. Yes. And the confidence, yes. which a lot of the time comes and it runs on autopilot, but there's times even before I be, get behind the mic and talk to great guests like yourself where I have to take the controls in that confidence. I have to be manually confident and speak to myself and reassure myself. How Do, do you experience yeah. insecurities, fears, and doubts when you're training or when you're preparing for a fight? That's been a big issue from since I was a, a young adult, a young, young, like since I was like maybe 13, 12, 13 years old, I've I've had major insecurity battles with myself, and uh, like I said, the martial arts has helped me to overcome these insecurities. We all have insecurities, but it's how we how we look at it and how we handle it. For me, I get my confidence and I overcome my security insecurities from the dedication and hard work that I put into my craft. That's how I get my confidence by putting in the hours and of of training and also I do a lot of other things like meditation yoga these are things that are necessary to keep ourselves calm and relaxed and positive but we all have these feelings of insecurity it's an it's an absolute normal thing but you know we need to stay strong we need to believe in ourselves and for me I just kind of reflect on all the things that I've done in my life all the hard work that I put into this craft and that's what gives me that spark and that's what helps me overcome my insecurities and I, I also like to talk to the people around me I share my share my feelings with my the people that are close to me with my mother my father uh, my coaches my teammates right and uh, hey in, being in, insecure that's a normal thing if you're not insecure then I would maybe be a little concerned that something might be wrong but we all have insecurity issues and uh, like I said for me it's been through overcoming it has been through the martial arts has helped me overcome it meditation yoga and more importantly for me surrounding myself with the positive people and uh, that's what's uplifting and that's what's going to help me overcome those those issues. Hey, thanks for sharing. Alex, I wish you all the success, which you truly deserve. And here at the show, we're very enthusiastic about your UFC career. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, I hope to be back on very soon. This has been an interview with UFC fighter Alex Ricci. Hi, I'm Bob Wall, a World Full Contact Karate Champion, and I'm the co-star of Into the Dragon. You're listening to Martial Arts World Radio with Joseph Clark. So I'm on a website called funtrivia.com, and I'm doing a timed quiz called Martial Arts 200. 
So we're going to ask a few questions here and challenge ourselves on our knowledge of martial arts. The first question is, how many forms are there in Bando, the Burmese martial art? 10, 12, 7, or 15? And the correct answer is 12. There are 12 forms in Bando. Who is the founder of Taekwondo? General Hong Hee Choi. General Choi founded Taekwondo in 1955, bringing together the various Kwans under the style name of Taekwondo. It comes from the ancient Taekayan kicking art of Korea and karate. What is the name of the temple in China that is considered to be the birthplace of most Kung Fu systems? Hunan, Shinang, Wudang, or Shaolin? And of course our answer is Shaolin. The Shaolin Temple is credited with being the place where most styles of Kung Fu originated. It is still in operation today, still training martial artists in the fighting arts and the Buddhist lifestyle. What is the name of the most famous samurai in Japan's history? And of course, the answer is Miyamoto Masashi, who we've spoken about in previous episodes of Martial Arts World Radio. He was the author of the book of Five Rings. Miyamoto Masashi was the most famous samurai in Japan's history. He wrote the Book of Five Rings, which deals with strategy. He also founded his own style of sword fighting, which utilized two swords. What was the name of Bruce Lee's teacher? Takwan, Bo Sim Mark, Yip Man, or Yim Wing Chun? And of course, the correct answer is Yip Man. Yip Man was the Wing Chun master that taught Bruce Lee originally before he studied other styles to create Jeet Kune Do. And our last question, what is the name of the spear that the samurai used? The Yari, the Gunto, the Kuji, or the Nagatana? And the correct answer is the Yari. It's a small-headed spear that the samurai used in battle, sometimes used to dismount an enemy on horseback. This is Mark Hebsher, and you're listening to Joseph Clark on Martial Arts World Radio. For those of you listening to Martial Arts World Radio while on your phones, tablets, or laptops, be sure to check out www.worldblackbelt.com, the world's foremost martial arts online community. Also, Google the book The Tao, T A O, The Tao of MMA, or go to Amazon and do a search for The Tao of MMA. Nia Nicole Abdallah of Houston, Texas, is a 2004 Olympic silver medalist and the first U.S. woman to officially medal in Taekwondo at the Olympics. In 2007, Nia received the highest honor in the martial art Olympic sport of Taekwondo when she was inducted into the official Taekwondo Hall of Fame. Nia, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me today. Oh, it's a real pleasure. Now, Nia, I have so many questions for you. However, I must satisfy my own curiosity by asking... Where is your silver medal right now? Uh, sitting right next to my bed. <laughs> <laughs> um, the funny thing about the silver medal is um, what people don't realize is that's more for the other people. The experience is what um, us as Olympians um, really enjoy and really the memory sure. of it is what we went after. The medal is just something to show y'all what my, our memory was. So um, I, I try to treat it better, but at first I used to just stick it in my pocket and take it everywhere I went. <laughs> Yeah, I don't blame you. I have to tell you, if I was an Olympic medalist, I'd never take that thing off. Now, please walk us through, if you will, what age were you when you began taking Taekwondo instruction? So I began um, taking Taekwondo at age nine, um, but I had been ambitious for an Olympic medal since I was eight, four years old. Uh, when I was four, my grandfather um, was a big Olympics person, and he kind of sat me down and, and walked through what the Olympics really meant and about how back in the days... Um, it was a time where all war stopped, all fighting stopped, and they just played sports. And I kind of fell in love with that idea at age four. And um, I went and told my mom that I'm, I'm going to go win the Olympics. I, I told my mom I was serious at age four. I can see myself on the podium at age four. Um, and so I kind of went into all kinds of sports from there. Um, I've done just about every sport. And at age nine, I was a little key, I was a little runt, and me and my stepdad plotted together to say, oh, well, let's put me in martial arts. Um, to, you know, give me discipline and, you know, all the quote-unquote things that 
martial arts are supposed to give you. And I was a little a kid, so that you know, helped me defend myself. And that's what we sold my mom. And my mom calls it an after school program that never ended. And so from day one, it was like that was where I was supposed to be. I was a natural at it um, and became successful really, really early in the sport. So please walk us through what the amateur competition circuit looked like in order to qualify for the Olympic team. Um, well, it, the funny part is it's ch- it changes every year. Right now, um, the way it happens now or this last Olympics is totally different than the way that it happened for me. Um, when it was me, we didn't have the point systems and stuff like that that they had. You just had to go to the right tournaments and, and win the right uh, fights. And a fun fact about me is I hadn't, before I made the Olympic team, I hadn't made a national team. Um, I was at the Olympic Training Center in, in Colorado Springs, and I was training there. Um, but I was a B team member. I really wasn't going to any international competitions. Um, and we had a team trials for the Pan Am Games, and I won that. So I'm the only rookie on the team, and I ended up getting a, a bronze medal at that, that tournament, which put my weight division um, in the category. Again, I still hadn't made a regular national team, junior team, none of those. I hadn't made any of those teams. Um, and went through the process of going to the tournaments to qualify. Um, I had to win a, a tournament in the U.S. Then uh, from that tournament, I had to go qualify in Mexico, and I qualified there. And then from there, I, I had number one seed to fight in the U.S. for the spot for the Olympics, and I made the Olympic team. So a lot of people don't know that I made the Olympic team before I made a national team. And what was the most challenging aspect about competing in the Olympics for you? Was it psychological? Was it emotional, physical? Um, I think it was a more psychological thing, and I was real, real um, blessed that about, I want to say, four or five months before, they had the test event, and I was invited to go to the test event, and again, I'm telling you that I had I had little international experience, and at the test event, I really got to fight these girls, but I was intimidated at the test event, and I ended up losing, like, my second fight, and afterwards, in hindsight, I realized that these girls were just as good as me, like, I could beat them, um, and it was in my head that was making me not, so I, I got that, those jitters out of my head, so when I went to the Olympics, I was like, I'm good enough to win the gold. Um, it was just a, a lot of the stuff at the Olympics was lack of experience. Um, but I, I didn't. I went there to win. Like I, in every, I probably me and my family probably the only people that thought I could get a silver. Um, but I believed in. I've been believing it since I was four. So once you were selected for the Olympic team, how long do you train from that point until you actually compete in the Olympics? We actually only had about two months in between, two or three months in between, um, because we had the tr- team trials process. Um, and so I just had a couple of months to kind of get ready, and that was more of a mental thing. Um, at, at, at Me and my training partner, uh, Jamie Houston, we we just trained together, and she just helped me prepare mentally of what we were about to do and, and where, where I, what I was about to go to and really um, talking to my family and talking to the people around me of really understanding that I can do this and having the right people around me was, was key. I didn't have a lot of people that told me I couldn't. Well, I didn't have anybody that told me that I couldn't do it. Everybody told me that I can win this. And so I went in there with the mentality of I can win this. I can, I can take the gold medal. How much of your training, you know, during that two months when you were then training with the Olympic team, how much of that training was psychological versus physical? Um, it still had. I still had to be physical, fit, okay, I, and I also had to cut weight at the time. I was fighting in the um, the fifty seven kilos uh, division, and so I. I mean, it was a, it was a, a physical battle, but it was a mental battle too. I, at the time, the Olympic Training Center was actually going through um, a transition where there was no longer going to be a program. But because I made the Olympic team, I was there. So it was me, my training partner, my coach, and two other people. Um, so it wasn't a full team there. It was just us. Um, we trained every day, and the, uh, kind of the cool thing about it was the focus was me. Uh, everybody was there to, you know, kind of help me improve and stuff like that. But it was physical, mental, emotional. I had to, to train all of that at the same time. Have you trained in other martial arts in addition to Taekwondo? I actually haven't, but I do want to try Capoeira one day. That's, that's on my bucket list. What is your opinion of UFC and MMA? Do you follow it? Um, I follow it kind of. It's not something for me because of the way the kind of fighter that I was I wasn't so much of a brawler and I'm more of a a chess player when it comes to fighting 
and that's that's not so much in in UFC. You have a little bit of chess playing, but you have to be just kind of a brawler. And I never was that. People asked me if I was going to go into that, and I'm, I always said that I don't like the odds. Um, you can be the best person in 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 that division and still get knocked out. Those are not good odds for me. So I'm a numbers I'm a numbers person. So I was just like, yeah, I'm gonna leave that alone to the people that um, can deal with those kind of odds. So Nia, at the Olympics, how many actual bouts did you have to participate in? I had four. You had four. So take us through, if you would, if you would reflect a moment out loud and take us through the winning fight, the last fight in which you won the silver medal. What was that like? So um, it was a semifinals match, and um, it was against a competitor that, that was smaller than me. And that had been my kind of uh, Achilles heel when it comes to um, fighting. I usually do well with, with taller athletes because that made me faster. But when I had to deal with faster, uh, more my mo- mobile uh, athletes, I was having a lot of issues with. So um, coming into that, I, I actually were, was up, I think it was 7 to two or something like that for majority of the fight and all of a sudden she just kept scoring and it the fight ended up being seven to eight um but she was quick and she just kept getting quick points in there and um it was a, it was a scary thought to watch those points just ding 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 up and finally we just i just kind of pulled it off uh, all the except for my first fight all the fights were real nail biter close fights I mean, I can only imagine the adrenaline, adrenaline level and the level of excitement that you must be feeling as you're participating in that last fight, because Taekwondo is a very fast-moving sport, especially, especially Olympic-class Taekwondo. Anything can happen so quickly. So when you scored that point, uh, did it sink in right away, or was it surreal? It didn't. I was still on... After that fight, I, was still, I still had a mission. Um, so it didn't sink in that I was I had just set records or that I was now in finals. It didn't sink in because my goal was to get the goal. So um, I really, really did. After I went in that fight, I was like, yes, but okay, what's next? And then after the um, the even after the final fight when I lost um, two to one, I was upset as an athlete. I was like, I didn't do what I came here to do, and I was really upset. And it took me i mean six months to a year to really realize that i got a, i won a silver medal i was telling people people were like congratulations i was like for what i lost like in my head i didn't receive i didn't do the thing that i set out to do and so it didn't really sink in in the moment that what you know that i won a silver medal it sunk in that i lost the gold now nia your style of taekwondo everybody i don't care who it is regardless of what they train in they bring something unique and personal and distinctive to it. What makes you distinctive when you're fighting Taekwondo? Um, the funny part is my flaw became my, my greatest asset. Um, when I was younger, I, 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 I was real, real small, like I told you, but I grew really, really quickly. And so I became a really, really slim, flexible athlete. So uh, they used to call me Jello because my, my legs were like Jello. And that actually became my asset. So I, I became efficient in kicking people in the head, but it was because my leg didn't come up the way that everybody else. My head kicks never came the same way. I can do them from really, really close. They came out of nowhere. They came over the shoulder. And so I became known for these head kicks. Even though I was known for it, that was something that I did, but it was just the way that my body functioned that I was able to do that. And also I, I trained at a young age, um, so I was really, really uh, strong really, really early. I trained from probably from age 13, 12, 13 years old until, you know, till I retired, I was up running, lifting weights. My stepdad had me in a full program. Um, so I was, I was a lot uh, stronger at a younger age than a lot of people. And it just, people didn't know that I was going to be that strong. So Nia, I have to ask just briefly, take us to that moment when you're standing on the podium and you're receiving that silver medal. What emotion were you feeling? I was mad. <laughs> like I said, I was, I was upset. I was so close to getting a goal. Um, all I could think about was what, what could I have did more? What did I do wrong? All those things were going through my head. Um, I really didn't get to soak up winning. It was more of I was soaking in the losing, and I had to get, yeah. you know, get my game face on and all that stuff. 
but I was upset. That was that was not the best smile that you ever see from me. <laughs> I was just it, as a competitor. I I mean, and what people don't realize is that we after the fight, you go downstairs and you immediately talk to media. You go in the back, get yourself together, and then you have to come back on the podium right away. Sure. So there was no time to depress, you know, get everything out. And so I hadn't even cried yet. And I was on the podium like, oh, I'm ready to get off of here. They playing their, their national anthem, not mine. So I was really upset more than anything else. Now, Nia, you're hired to do keynote speaking and inspirational talks in which you emphasize, quote, living like a champion through Bacho, B-A-C-H-O. What is Bacho? So Bacho is something that um, came up through the, uh, about the 90s. Some people will remember uh, Taekwondo that far back. Um, we used to say words like bacho, pacho, all that stuff. And so me and a couple of my friends started saying it as a joke. Um, and then when I started, when I retired and was saying that um, I'm going to start, you know, promoting living, promoting living like a champion. And how I got that concept was I looked at my life and the steps that I took to become uh, successful in Taekwondo are the same steps that I look at CEOs or I look at anybody that's successful. They took those, those same steps. And so I kind of broke it down. And since I was using that word and I was known for that word, I said, how can I incorporate that into it? And so I made it an acronym, and it stands for Believe, Associate, Choose, Hone, and Obtain. And those are basically the steps that I took. First, I had to believe that I could be a champion at a young age, I believe. Then I had to associate that thing that I, I, I could be a champion in, that thing that comes naturally to me, the thing that I wake up wanting to do. Then I had to choose to do the work. Um, choose to make better decisions for my life that I could be successful. Then I had to hone in and focus on that skill um, and put other things aside so I can focus in that one thing. And then I had to obtain it, and that's the one that, one part that a lot of people forget that you'll see a lot of athletes get all the way to the Olympics or all the way to World Championships and then don't do it. Um, but you have to have that, that oomph to say, I've done all the work, now I'm going to actually go get it. Now, Nia, do you have a website where you'd like to direct our, direct our listeners? Yes. Um, you can go to my Facebook. I have a Facebook page called NIA USA. Um, and if you have any inquiries about doing um, public speaking and I do seminars, um, anything like that, you can email me at NIAUSA at Hotmail.com. Nia, you are an incredible inspiration, and I want to thank you for joining us on Martial Arts World Radio today. Best of luck to you. Oh, thank you for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. This has been an interview with U.S. Olympic Taekwondo medalist, Nia Nicole Abdallah. This is Olivier Gruner. You are listening to Martial Arts World Radio with Joseph Clark. What was the worst dilemma you have ever faced? I remember as a child when our family faced unfortunate human events. During those dilemmas, my parents would square their shoulders and condition us that There is nothing that we cannot overcome as a family. These were poignant moments for my family, and we did overcome and recover as a result of my parents' leadership and resolve. When do we define ourselves as human beings? Do our defining moments occur during difficult times or when everything is going rosy? Close your eyes for a few seconds and remember one of your greatest defining moments to date. Was it a defining moment because it came with little cost or because it had great difficulty attached to it? Did you step out of the rut of daily life and discover different paths or truer answers? I propose we must embrace the challenges presented by difficult times. Now, before you go questioning my sanity, allow me to explain myself. After all, who would propose such a preposterous notion as embracing the difficulties imposed on us by our worst nightmares becoming reality. Simply put, we discover our defining moments during times of challenging circumstances. The Chinese word for crisis is a compound of danger and opportunity. Do we fall down because gravity governs objects that are heavier than air, or do we fall down to learn how to get back up? And once we are on our feet, are we not wiser, better, and stronger people? Scientists state that the fate of everything is determined by the atomic structure of everything. Religions state that our fate is the will of God. This gives rise to the legitimate question, just what is it that we actually have control over? The answer? 
how we respond to poignant moments. Notice that I did not say how we react, but rather how we respond. How we respond to poignant moments and how we choose to view the world around us. This is of paramount importance in life. This applies equally to the elite, the fortunate, the less fortunate, and the marginalized. The Greek philosopher Protagoras was famous for the maxim, man is the measure of all things. During your difficult times, do you want the substance of your life to be sweet or sour? Because history has taught us that we determine that flavor. We are the measure of all that is good and all that is intolerable in our lives. We do well to remember the ancient Chinese proverb that tells us that there are three things that never return. The spoken word, the sped arrow, and the neglected opportunity. I urge you to resolve not to neglect the opportunity found in challenging moments. The doing of it demands personal reflection and discipline in order to habitually turn the chaotic flotsam of our daily lives to our advantage. It requires of us idealism and passion during instances when we are least inclined to be virtuous. Is it easy? In all the world, there is nothing more difficult and more worthy of the effort. And like any great endeavor, the more difficult the road, the more satisfaction lies in the completion of the journey. Whatever wrong you have suffered, it is a temporary crisis, a temporary crisis which could well be your defining moment. History has taught us that during times of challenging circumstances, we find our true greatness. This greatness is in you. And I believe without mental reservation that you have the potential to take your problems and your challenges and your goals by the horns and pursue peace, harmony, and personal excellence. What are your hopes and dreams? What are your ambitions? Have you got a plan to turn crisis into opportunity? Dear listeners, with all my heart, I wish you all the success, love, peace, and harmony, and victory that you deserve. This is world champion Steve Nasty Anderson. You are listening to Martial Arts World Radio with Joseph Clark. Our next guest has participated in martial arts history in the making several times over. Ron Van Cleef fought in the fourth ever UFC against Hoist Gracie. He served as a commissioner with the UFC. He competed in over 900 martial arts tournaments over 40 years. He won the All-American Karate Championship at 60 years of age. He was a martial arts cinema star, a decorated Marine, and he established his own martial arts system, and he was nicknamed the Black Dragon by none other than Bruce Lee himself. And that is just scratching the surface. Joining us from Hawaii is Ron Van Cleef. Welcome, Ron. Good morning. How are you today? Very well, thanks. Yourself? Excellent. Getting ready for class tonight? I'm ready for another a good role. Now, I understand you're training for a tournament still, are you not? Yes, I am. I'm getting ready to co- participate in my fourth BJJ tournament. And how old are you? Ron? At 72, I started doing BJJ tournaments. I'm 73. I'll be 74 in January. So you've been training in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Have you been training with a family member? I'm training with Helson Gracie. And take us back to UFC 4. Did you know at that time that you were participating in what would be a piece of MMA history and the start of a movement? I had no idea. You know, I saw UFC 3 on television, a pay-per-view event. I was sitting with my student, The Last Dragon, in Timok, and we were watching it. And I said, you know, I have to do this. I have to do it. And, you know, I was 51 at the time, and everyone tried to discourage me from doing it. But I knew that if you're a real martial artist, how could you let an opportunity like that go? I mean, it would be crazy to let that opportunity pass without giving it my 100%. So how did you get hooked up with them or invited to uh, qualify or to, to compete? Um, one of my students, Howard Diego, who um, trains with um, Henzo Gracie, spoke to Al um, R. Davies. And Art Davies gave me an interview up at the uh, 
SEG office. It was SEG then. It wasn't UFC. It was SEG uh, with Bob Marowitz and Art Davies and Campbell McLaren. And I had just run the New York Marathon about uh, two weeks before I went up there. So he said, you're 51 years old. Why, why would you do something like this? You're already a world champion. You're an All-American. You're Hall of Famer, blah, 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 blah. How could someone not let an opportunity like that go? No rules, no time limit, no weight division, something that I had never participated in before. So I had to give it a shot. And you did. I mean, you stepped into that cage and instantly had everyone's respect. What was it like fighting Hoist Gracie? Well, let me say that one week before the show, I broke my left ankle. But I realized at that point that I could not change my mind and not go. I had to participate because I really wanted to. And I had trained for three months very hard. I trained with wrestlers, I trained with judo people, I trained with lots of guys. And my friend, Leon Stevenson, who is a 250-pound, uh, 6'5", bodybuilder, judo player, uh, threw a suplex on me, and I hit my ankle on the, the wood frame of the mat and fractured my ankle one week before the show. So you fought in UFC 4 with a week. fractured ankle. So I decided that I was going to do it anyway. And it was one of the most exhilarating experiences of my life. It was the most exciting. I mean, you cannot even imagine the rush that I got when I stepped into the octagon and I saw Hoyce on the other side of the octagon. It was truly epic. I knew I was in the right place. And that crowd was electric. Oh my goodness. It was spectacular. I mean, who could not feel the energy in that arena? That was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It was, just, it was just amazing. I mean, it was truly amazing. Imagine no weight division, no time limit, no gloves, basically no rules. So, Ron, you have been a fight choreographer on several films, including the movie The Last Dragon, and you've authored several books. Tell us about the books you've authored. Well, I've written 11 books so far. My first book was The Manual of the Martial Arts, which was in 1980, and that became the textbook for the Secret Service here in the United States. I was the um, senior defensive tactics instructor at the World Trade Center from 1983 to 1993. At the World Trade Center? Yes, sir. And by the way, for our listeners who are on their tablets and devices, what website would you like to direct them to today? Uh, RonBankley.com. Now, you are a five-time karate and kung fu world champion and a 15-time All-American champion. Were you able to make a living from martial arts, or was there always another form of income? I never even thought about making my living from the martial arts. The martial arts has always been my, my love. I mean, I started training when I was 13 years old in jiu-jitsu with the Grandmaster Moses Powell in stand-up jiu-jitsu, in traditional Japanese jiu-jitsu. And that was 1957. 1957. And you trained with Bruce Lee in Hong Kong, correct? I trained with Bruce Lee in Hong Kong. I was one of his classmates. Bruce was the one that inspired me to become a martial arts movie star. He said, you're the Black Dragon. Bruce saw me fight at the All-American I think it was 1966 or 1967. And he said to me, you're the Black Dragon. And we both laughed about it. And uh, years later, 1974, my first film was The Black Dragon. I was the first um, foreigner to headline Hong Kong Kung Fu films. I worked in over 300 films. I was a stunt coordinator for 40 years. I was the, um, the chairman of the Stunt and Safety Committee with the Screen Actors Guild for 20 years. And in the 300 films that I worked in, I've done high dives, falls, uh, car crashes. Um, I mean, almost every stunt you could ever really uh, imagine. I was Samuel Jackson's stunt double with, in Die Hard with a Vengeance. I've been a stuntman for over 40 years. I retired from the Screen Actors Guild in 2011. 
because my body just started feeling beat up, the stress of so many years of sure. Death. Do you have a favorite favorite fighter? Like I know through the years, uh, I'm sure that you know we interview fighters on this show. Bob Wall. Um, I've interviewed Gene LaBelle for one of my books. Um, oh, you know, Wonderful I know that you've crossed paths, no doubt, with Chuck Norris and some, you know, Richard Norton and other great fighters. I'm just curious, mm-hmm. do you have a favorite? Is there a particular fighter who... From the old days or from now? Well, let's start with the old days first. Um, Chuck Norris is one of my favorites. Chuck Norris. He's a six-time world champion. I mean, he's still going and he's, he's 77 years old. I mean, he's an inspiration and a motivation to generations of martial arts. But there have been so many great martial arts that I've had the opportunity to either work out with or watch in their tournament participation. You know, Joe Lewis was amazing. Bob Wall was amazing. There were just so many great. Benny the Jet, Don Wilson. The list can go on and on and on and on of really great masters and Fighters. I mean, these were real warriors in the old days, the golden era of martial arts in America, the 60s through the 70s. You saw some of the most amazing, amazing practitioners of all the arts, Hapkido, Karate, Taekwondo, Murakwan, Judo. There were so many amazing, Dan Inosanto. There were just so many amazing martial arts that I saw at that time. They were just amazing. It was certainly a golden era. Like that today. There's nothing like that today. Now, speaking of which, today, do you have a favorite martial artist today? Is that MMA? We're talking about general martial arts. Uh, let's talk MMA. MMA. Oh, boy. we got a long list there. Let's see. Let's go with, um, let's go with the older guys first. Dan Severin, Olaf Taktarov, uh, Hicks and Gracie, Hoist Gracie, um, Don Fry, the Predator, Randy Couture. You got quite a long list, Ron. Well, I've been a fan of MMA since its inception in America. When I became the commissioner in 1994 of the UFC, um, I was hired to make the event more uh, telegenic and to give it uh, some validity in that there were different martial arts styles coming together as a brotherhood. Mm-hmm. It was yep. a wonderful, wonderful concept. I'm actually doing an event in Barbados on November 25th, and it will be an homage to the original UFC. It will be an event, an eight-man single elimination event, no rules, no time limit, no weight division. It will be the Ron Van Cleef Absolute MMA Championship. So I'm super excited about that sounds like an exciting prospect for you. I mean, I mean nobody's going to rule you out given all of your experience and just your, your philosophy seems to be one that is unyielding. Well, I'm going to compete next month in another BJJ tournament. I plan to compete until 2020. I want to compete until I'm 80. Now, by the way, okay, so prior to your fight with Hoist Gracie, had you trained as a grappler or was that a new experience for you? A new experience. Okay. Totally Okay. Would it be safe to say now that after that experience and as you progressed as a martial artist that you became more well-rounded? I started studying the, the Gracie system, particularly the Health and Gracie system, um, five years ago. Um, I put on a white belt. I took off my red belt and I put on a white belt. And I go to class three or four days a week. I roll at least five to six rounds per night when I roll. Yep. And it's it, it's... It's a wonderful, wonderful experience. You know, it, it's actually a better experience for me than karate or kung fu because your body doesn't take the, the shock from impact. When you get 73, a punch in the teeth, a punch in the jaw, elbow in the ball, yeah. those things, uh, they last. Sure. I'm able to go and roll in the jujitsu and not injure myself. Of course, I'm sore and uh, tired and things like that because... You know, everyone I roll with is 30 and 40 years younger than me. But the experience and the, and the, the Gracie family has this, has this Ohana spirit, this family spirit 
within their system that transmits through the mat to yes. each individual. People in the dojo actually tell you what to do to combat their techniques, how to get out of different positions while you are rolling with them. Sure. You never get that in karate school. Now, Ron, I'm because sorry to interrupt, but we've got we've got 60 seconds to wrap up, and I want to ask you one quick response question, if I can. What advice do you have for our listeners on making a reality of their dreams? And this is going to be a quick quick answer for this one because we have to wrap up. Never, ever give up. Follow your dreams. You know, I wrote my book, The Hangman. It's my autobiography. It's going to be a feature film done by a major film company next year. So look out for it, The Hangman. It's available on Amazon. But never give up your dreams. Dream big. Never let anybody blow your bubble. We are capable as human beings to have unlimited human potential. And that's what it's all about. Being the best you can be in every way, every day. Ron, congratulations once again on the legacy that you have built and that you are still building. And until next time, I wish you all the best. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much, y'all. And have a good day and be happy and healthy. Ron Van Cleef, ladies and gentlemen. Be sure to check us out at our website at www.mawradio.com or at Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube by following Martial Arts World Radio. Thank you for listening. I'm Joseph Clark, wishing you safe travels.